Stay tuned. Coming up is my interview with retired fire chief Tom DeSorcy as we talk about the challenges he faced as he quickly went from being a volunteer firefighter to a career fire chief. Hello and welcome to the Situational Awareness Matters show, episode 397. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this show is to improve situational awareness and decision making for individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence, time compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming and time to prevent bad outcomes. Today's feature segment is sponsored by Gasaway Virtual Training. There are 33 online training programs for you to choose from. Some of the programs are live events presented virtually, and some of them are pre-recorded programs. To learn more, visit the samatters.com website and click on the virtual training tab. Okay, let's jump into our feature segment, my interview with fire, retired fire chief, Tom DeSorcy as we talk about the challenges he faced as he quickly went from being a volunteer firefighter to a career fire chief. My guest today is Tom DeSorcy. He joined the fire service in 1983 and became the first uh, paid firefighter in his hometown of Hope, British Columbia, when he became the fire chief <laughs> in 2000. Uh, this followed a career in broadcasting and local radio, and his talk show uh, was eventually heard all across Canada via satellite from Vancouver in the early 90s. Now retired, his voice can be heard on the Firefighting in Canada, the podcast show, and he lends his voice in narrating online training for firefighters. Tom is married, has two children, two grandchildren. He's equally at home on at a bond spiel, which I joked with him before we hit the recording that I had to Google search, even though I'm from Minnesota. I didn't know that a bond spiel means a curling tournament, which curling is popular in Minnesota, but I had never heard of that. So he also enjoys golfing and he's at home in the kitchen and he continues to enjoy his connections with the fire service. So what are we going to talk about today? Tom's story may be unique as he quickly went from serving as a volunteer firefighter to becoming the fire chief almost overnight. The town of Hope was surrounded by two regional district electoral areas and each had their own fire department. When all these areas were amalgamated into a district municipality, three fire departments existed, and it became apparent that a single fire department needed to be created, and thus a contract fire chief position was offered, which Tom accepted the position. Originally, this was supposed to be a 10-month contract. However, Tom realized that it could be extended to a permanent position and began to seek out training opportunities to put himself in the best possible position to be accepted if the job were offered to him. And that was in 1999. In 2000, the contract ran out and the permanent position was not being considered. This is when the existing volunteer chiefs all mustered up, put their pagers on the council table in a mass protest and submitted their resignation until Tom was hired. Tom then set out on a journey to create a modern fire department with the current social club that existed. Although I'm, I'm laughing because I've, I've lived this. All the while battling resistance to change, not only from within, but from the community as well. This was a struggle to say the least. It was through various associations and networking uh, that brought Tom uh, into the outside world of firefighting. He adopted a moss and grass, which we will talk about later, approach to leadership where he supported positive growth and ignored the naysayers that stood in his way. Today, he's come full circle in creating a succession plan where they now have a fire chief 
and a deputy in a progressive and busy fire department of professional volunteers. Tom and I first met, we were talking before we hit the recording room. Tom and I first met at the British Columbia Fire Chiefs Association Conference uh, where I was presenting and Tom was a member and maybe on the board. I don't, I don't quite remember all, all the way back in 2011 in Abbotsford. But there are, there are some things that we're going to talk about here in just a second that I do remember from that conference. Tom, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure, Rich. Uh, good to be with you. So uh, let's go back to 2011 when we first met because there were some shenanigans going on. You know, I'd never been to the BC Chiefs. I've since, I think, been there four or five times now. But um, yeah, my first visit was a little, a, a little, there were some odd things happening. Like, for example, you guys had a, a, a $20 bill that you were auctioning off and you were the auctioneer. I remember that. And my memory is that it, this $20 bill sold for something like $500. And I just sat there and, and just kind of rubbed my forehead like I was getting a migraine headache thinking, <laughs> what is it with these Canadians? You know, they, they're they going to take a $20 bill and sell it for $500? Who does that? So wh where did that whole idea come from? And And more importantly, let's talk about why you guys would do something. It's we we I, I, I jokingly said to you it was like the exchange rate, right? So um, it, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a bit of an icebreaker. Um, you know, I do this auction thing where um, you know I, I get up in front of a crowd and and sell items for charity and a couple of items, have some fun with it. I'm by no means a professional auctioneer. I just like to talk and, and use a microphone and uh, talk fairly quickly once in a while and. It, it goes back to my first one of my first fire chief conferences back in 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 the Okanagan in Pit, Penticton BC, where they auctioned off something and I was up on stage and they were trying to sell it and I said I, I can do better than that give me the microphone and I took over and before you know it I'm selling stuff like crazy and they're raising money for charity we we have a partners program uh, with the BC fire chiefs and uh, they raise funds for uh, for local and and charities and scholarships for volunteer firefighters those kind of things and and one of the tricks I was taught by an old friend of mine was to uh, do the icebreaker with a twenty dollar bill if people have never been to a formal auction, which certainly this isn't, it's it's a it's a theme night or a fun night, and uh, it gets the crowd into it. You know, you know what you're buying. You're buying a twenty dollar bill. You could buy it for five dollars. You know, and so it's easy to bid on something you know exactly what you're getting. And uh, of course, with the charity element, I think the first time we did this with the twenty dollar bill, we sold it for forty dollars. And so the next year, the the person brought it back. And his partner said, uh, she said, my husband bought this. He was crazy enough to 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 buy it for forty dollars, sell it again. And she he signed it. And so the same twenty dollar bill we sold for forty five dollars. And so it went on from there. And before you know it, it went back and forth from department to department. Some of the smaller ones really wanted to, you know, get the twenty dollar bill. And then it ended up on a plaque and the plaque had all the years and who bought it. So this is this is a, a perpetual kind of a thing that it's the same $20 bill you saw that today I think the last selling was twelve or $1,300. That, that volunteer fire halls, they will raise money internally themselves over the year and send their chief to the conference with the intent to try and purchase and bring back the $20 bill. Has there been any accounting of how much money that $20 bill has raised for charity? Going back on the plaque, and I can't remember it offhand, we try and do it every year, get the plaque, add it up real quick. And, and you know, if you go over time, it, it's got to be 12 or, you know, 12 or or twelve or $13,000 close to it. I mean, it just added up over that time period that we've raised for, for our charities. And uh, yeah, kind of fun, kind of remarkable. And they, they, they look forward to the actual $20 bill. And we tell the story every year and, and ramp on about, ramble on about, who won it, how it got, what happened to it. And, you know, it's had, it's been on its journeys, right? Where it's been to uh, across British Columbia. And I mean, there was one time it almost went to Minnesota. And so... <laughs> I just couldn't bring myself to keep on bidding when it got up to like $400. I'm like, yeah. I, I, I had some kind of epiphany that I was about to enter a twilight zone of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> but you would have had to come back with it the next year, right? 
Yeah, I would have. Yeah, I did. I did get outbid for that, but I, I, I don't remember if it was at that particular conference. My memory is it was a few years later that I bid against and rather robustly, and actually ended up um, beating Vic, Vince McKenzie out for a blanket that had That's right. um, uh, each organization that wins the blanket gets to put something on it or i can't remember all the details but man and you know it was cold out i remember that we were outdoor at a shelter and it was a little bit cold and vince and i started cuddling in this blanket together <laughs> and, and there were pictures taken and it was just it was so much fun but i i was so into it i i couldn't stop <laughs> bidding and i don't remember what i bid that won but it was yeah and, and, yep. and then the thing is you don't keep it you know you just you 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 buy it you keep it for a year and you give it back yep. and uh yeah uh, oh it was it's i've had so much fun with the folks of of bc it's, that that trip was in that was in that was in penticton bc that was in the okanagan i think it was the train ride that we would have went yep. on that that yep. day uh, yeah. Summerland is the area is called and it's the old steam train that's a tourist attraction that we had our theme night and yeah. subsequently our uh, auction and 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 such uh, at that same evening yeah well okay let's get on track because <laughs> <laughs> I, I could go on down memory lane let's get on track here we're going to talk about your career and we're going to talk about your mm, the term I would call it the climb down the ladder your preparation for an eventual retirement from the fire service and lessons you learn and advice that you might have for people who would be in a similar track. But let's start by talking about your community and the makeup of your community. And, you know, I, I would guess that many people, myself included, have never been to Hope. Um, I'm not sure if you showed me a map of BC that I could put, point my finger to it. So tell you know, teach us a little bit about the community. Hope, uh, Hope, BC is uh, about two hours to the east of Vancouver, uh, in the uh, on this, this is south uh, south coast as we call it. We are two hours uh, west of the Okanagan, which is uh, what we call our Napa Valley, uh, Kelowna area uh, in wine country. We have five highways that converge in Hope. Literally, if you drive from Vancouver anywhere in Canada, with a with a one exception or south of the border, you have to go through Hope. Uh, those five highways uh, also include uh, two railways, the two national railways that, that come through our through our community, and uh, two oil pipelines, a hydrocarbon and a natural gas uh, national pipelines that that come through our community. Not to mention fiber optics and power and and such that feeds uh, the Lower Mainland. And I refer to the Lower Mainland as, as Vancouver and the city. Um, it's a community that started out before the amalgamation of 3,500 people. Uh, small town. Uh, I grew up, I was born and raised in, in this community. My dad was a volunteer firefighter and the volunteer fire department was one that in the 70s and 80s was, you know, it was, it go looking back, it was scary. It was as a firefighter, knowing what I know now, it, it is, it is, it was a concern. It is, a, you know, that's the way it was. It was, it was a social club. It was, you know, I was brought in, I was voted on the night you know, the first night it was come on into the department you know, your dad's in yeah you you cast you we cast our vote you've been accepted you uh you got a position you're the social convener okay because you were i worked in the radio station and i was kind of a outgoing you know individual still am and uh i i um i i got involved when they gave me a pager and a key the first night and it's like uh what do i do if this goes off it's like show up well do i have gear do i what do we oh we'll figure it out if it happens uh, we didn't do a lot of calls. Uh, we didn't do anything but go to fires. Um, it was jump on the back of the truck, no gear, just away you go. So as a community, the 3,500 population, we were surrounded by two other communities, smaller uh, bedroom communities, if you will, of, of our of our town. But they were in that regional district and there was a different local government. But in those days, instead of saying, well, we we have residential areas, we need fire protection, Let's contract to the Hope Fire Department to be our fire protection, which is, you know, just a couple of miles away. It's not, not that far away. It's a it's a two minute drive into 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 one area to the other. 
and they they just no they don't do that they never did that they wouldn't they were, their fire trucks were not going to ever leave their community and uh, they formed their own fire department each of them so we had two fire departments outside of our community with mutual aid agreements of some kind in place that I found and uh, yeah we we again same volunteer style a little bit more progressive for the training side of things in terms of you know their their uh, gathering and wearing gear to every call which was unique for me uh, from the early days. And, um, you know, chiefs were elected. Uh, it was an annual meeting. You know, you could be anybody to, uh, as a firefighter and you're the chief the next day, you know, kind of thing. So it was this, there was no qualifications. It was like, you're now the chief. And again, the call volume, I guess, in those days wasn't as much. Um, didn't do medical calls, didn't do car crashes. I mean, we didn't do auto extrication. Uh, to this day, there is still um, a road rescue society that exists in our community that leaves town and goes into the into the mighty re nether regions of hope and, and up in the Coquihalla Highway, also known as the Highway Through Hell on television on our Discovery Channel show. But they, uh, they, you know, we're just getting into that now. But at the end of the day, that was the makeup of hope. So here you have a 3,500 population, these two outlying areas. And they said, well, we need to amalgamate this. We need to bring this together for the tax base. It makes economic sense. Let's let's join them. They had a vote. And the the, um, the referendum was was in place, and boom, it was happening. In 1996, 97, we've got a new community. The town of Hope became the district of Hope, and the district of Hope from population went from 3,500 one day to 6,500 the next. And it's like whoa. And the the outlying area, outlying world said, wait a second, what happened there? Businesses started to come to Hope, you know, major chains started showing up, fast food chains realized that Hope doubled in population almost overnight. And that's when a few years later, they realized we have three fire departments in our town. We, we, you know, that, that we need to amalgamate this. And that's where the amalgamation of the departments came into play, which essentially was three separate organizations that were brought together under one umbrella. So again, the community went from a small community to a larger community. We're still the same community. Those people were always there. They always went to shop in the community. They are always part of it. Just on paper, weren't part of the big district municipality, which we are now. And I say big, we're still about 6,500 people in, in our community. Um, a community that is an aging community in terms of we used to be uh, big in industry and the logging industry was our big thing. That that day is gone now. There used to be a sawmill uh, about 40 minutes away. A lot of people worked in those sawmills or in the forest as as uh, as loggers. Uh, we were a gas station community. You know, we we had I, I think we had about 10 or 12 gas stations as you know, being this this mecca of five uh, five highways coming through our community. Of course, back in the day, we didn't have the five highways. We were only down to about three or four because they hadn't built the super highway yet. But, uh, you know, you. You've gone from from 12 gas stations down to three or four. You know, it's a different era. And uh, it it just it, we have a lot of challenges from an emergency perspective, from a risk management perspective, the railways, the the uh, the pipelines, the traffic. It's it's added a whole new wrinkle, a lot different from when it was in 1980, for sure. Um at the front end of this conversation, you framed it up as like the three separate fire departments who were happy to be three separate fire departments. So when it come to amalgamating the three fire departments, were the three fire departments all on board? Like, yeah, yeah, this is something that we want to do. Or was it something that they were told they had to do? And then there was some kicking and fighting along the way. There, there was a bit of both. Uh, there was kicking and fighting, and I was very aware of that when I took on the position. My position was that it was it was very everything I did was purposeful. Everything I tried to do was purposeful in terms of the 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 cresting. You know, you see the crest that's the District of Hope Fire Department. We were the Hope Fire Department. We were the Kakawa Lake Fire Department, and we were the Flood Laidlaw Silver Creek Volunteer Fire Department. So those that identity was being stripped away from two well three departments they were acceptant of they were accepting of district little things but they were accepting of district but not hope so it was purposeful that we made sure that district of hope was on the crest we didn't have crests we didn't have those kind of things we had a we had a uh what do you call it? a letterman jacket that we had with a with a logo a big you know a embroidered crest of our department having a uniform having a shirt we didn't have those kind of things. 
I brought those in. Again, I, I every fire truck that we had, it, 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 their trucks, they bought themselves through the amalgamation. The District of Hope took over those fire departments, took the ownership over all the assets, all the fire halls. It was in, in hindsight, it was pretty good because when we amalgamated, the public works department didn't amalgamate public works departments from three separate areas. They only had one. So they had a couple of snow plows, for example, didn't have all the actual tools and equipment. But when we amalgamated fire departments, we took on three fire halls. We took on three engines or, or pumpers. We took on three water tenders. We had all of this stock, if you will, in supply that we were able to use and then start to upgrade and build. I made sure that I took the crests of the separate previous departments and put them on the back doors of all the fire trucks. Uh, created a separate sticker. Even though we changed the lettering of some of them, the district came in, but we made sure we kept that uh, that history uh, in that because I was part of the Hope Department and I was part of the Laidlaw, the Flood Laidlaw Silver Creek Department in my later years because I moved back into the community from living in Vancouver for a few years, coming back into that area, joined that fire department and uh, got reconnected to the fire service, so to speak but then made sure that we didn't call, we made sure we called it the District of Hope, but we we had to transition very slow. The annual meetings were transitioned very slow. There was no more elections of fire chiefs. We I didn't allow that. That was just, that was just dangerous, you know, dangerous to elect. You showed up for the meeting today. You're now the fire chief. Well, that's, that's not appropriate. And, and so it was, it, it was timely. I mean, you, you take the, as much as we we joke in the fire service that you know we got no problem with change, we just don't want to change, and 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 these these individuals, these firefighters, especially the older ones, and I, this is my definition of generational change. We and and where the moss and grass thing came into play, which I just fell into, was the idea that you kind of had to know the individuals you were dealing with, and when it came, for example, we had a truck that went down in the downtown fire hall. We still responded two separate halls and they were the halls are close together you know they're a couple of miles apart if that and so if you had this model today you would not build these three fire halls this close to each other in a small town but we've got them they're there they're assets they're buildings and they they're garages for the fire trucks basically in the early beginning days when a page went off it paged hall one downtown to go to a call in their area if they needed help they would ask for a page to hall two well, we had 15 members per hall. We had a good stock of people. Now we've got 18 people total in our department still coming from the same three halls with a different uh, response model, response approach. So one day we had an engine that went down for service. So it was going to be down for a couple of days and out of service. So our busiest hall would got the most calls. I took one of the engines from one of the other halls and put it into that hall for a couple of days. It met with some backlash. That fire truck is leaving our area. It should not leave our area. Uh, it is still in the area. It's in the new area. Well, there were the, the older members, the senior members were not very pleased with the fact that I moved that fire truck, albeit for a few days into that fire hall. And uh, they didn't get the idea that while they on, on, Face value, it was, yeah, we like, we're happy, we support the amalgamation. But when push came to shove, sometimes it was, oh, the back went up and they really didn't support it. And you could tell. We uh, we we quickly got ahead of where I wanted to be in this interview because we didn't, we went, went, went right past how you became the fire chief and started talking of about. Some yeah, we can, we can backtrack, of course. As, yeah. as the fire chief. So let's, let's back up to, you're the, you're a volunteer firefighter. Mm -hmm. There's, there are three fire chiefs, right? Yes. You're not one of them. No, no. And they're going to amalgamate. And now there's only going to be one fire chief and it ends up being you. So how did that happen? Well, you know, and you, and everyone, when you became the elected fire chief of your, your fire hall or your department at the time or your hall, then you were elected primarily from a senior kind of earned it. You kind of, you were the, either the, deputy chief and you moved your way up and and i i joked and, and say that yeah if you showed up for the meeting that night you could be put in place and that that's true it could be in this democratic way of uh, of choosing a fire chief but the the amalgamation i don't know where the actual 
need for the amalgamation came. Somehow there was some meetings, there was something, some advisors came in from other departments in the outlying areas that said, we'll help you join these forces together. You know, the budget needs to be one budget, not three. So they posted uh, a posting and said that we have a, a, a need for uh, an interim fire chief for a 10 month contract. And it was 1999 and I was working in small town radio uh, you know, I had done my radio gig. I started in, in Hope in, in the, just out of high school, out of, in about 1981, um, started broadcasting, doing, you know, media, M had an opportunity to, to leave media locally just for, again, funding, single person living at home. Let's move to Vancouver and, and be a sales rep for a beverage alcohol company. I was a wine and, and spirit beer sales rep, um, in, 1989 88 89 in vancouver and so did that when the company after the gulf war uh ran into financial problems and pretty much shut down and moved into another uh, arm of their firm and we all got boom we're out the door so i'm back in my community moved back to home got into this fire department in silver creek as we call it and again i'm brand new i'm a couple of years into the being the fire i know the amalgamation's coming i can sort of feel it but then they put the posting up and i thought well yeah, it'd be something to try. There was no intent at the beginning for me to say, this is now going to be my career. But I thought I'd, I'd help be a manager. So I'm going to be as the interim fire chief. And I was selected for that position uh, right. for the 10-month contract. Were you competing with any of the other three fire chiefs? I, you know, I don't, I think I might've been the only person oh, that okay. put his hand up. You know, I think I okay. stepped forward and everyone stepped back. I, I think okay. no one wanted it uh, from, there was no other fire chiefs that put it up. They were they were working in their own businesses and, and such. They thought, no, I don't want to do this. I don't want too old for this. I don't want to. So I'm a younger guy, you know, it's 20, 24 years ago. And I said, yeah, I, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's just give it a try. You never know. And it wasn't long after when I first started trying to see what we were trying to do, I thought maybe there's a future. I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to just after 10 months say, okay, now you run yourself with volunteer district chiefs or hall chiefs, as we called them. Uh, called them district chiefs at the time, you know, and, and it's like, I need to put myself in a position to, you know, to maybe take a job if it becomes available. And that was when I, 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 I had a C, we call them the CAO, the town manager was an interim position uh, that was in place at the time. And he had a friend at the justice Institute in Vancouver and uh, in New Westminster and said, let me talk to him. He's in charge of the fire Academy. Let's see what they got. And so he said they got a brand new course. They're just unveiling. It's called Fire Officer One. Oh, okay. So yeah, he said this would be perfect for you. Uh, okay. So I went and my boss at the time at the radio station said, uh, yeah, fine. I mean, I was one of two employees then. The station was starting to whittle down in terms of, you know, we had four or five people in a small town station, part of a little radio network in the Fraser Valley. And I said, can I take this? You know, it might be my future. Oh, that'd be great. I'm more than happy to have you take that. So I went down, drove down once every once every week and twice, twice a day every other week and took this course for 16, 18 weeks in fire officer one. And the the district, the town district at the time paid for it, which was great, and uh, took the training. As it happened later on, as this progression started to change, that a large broadcasting firm brought bought our company and the writing was kind of on the wall that there was going to be no radio station in hope for a small town and and maybe i did make the right decision now how do they hire me um you go back in time to again a council that said we're too small a town to have a fire chief we have fire chiefs they're 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 voted on by their members they're volunteers and i said uh, you need to have a paid manager you need to have risk management in your fire department this is this town's going to grow and you need, it's not just a local little group of people getting together on a practice night and, and washing the fire trucks and playing cards that, that that's no, we got to take this thing seriously because the times they are a changing. And um, that's, that's when, you know, we went to numerous meetings and it came to a point it was in, I uh, forget the actual month time of year, but those, when I said the fire chiefs, the three of them went to council and said, you need to hire this person. He's going to be uh, out of a contract and uh, he can't just quit his job and come to work for you part-time. 
Um, then they put their pagers on the table and walked out. And the mayor said, "What are you doing?" He said, "We said, well, we're not the we're not we're not in the fire department anymore. You're the fire department tonight, mayor and council." And they said, "You can't quit." And he said, "Yeah, we can quit. We're volunteers." And they walked out. And now things got real, and it's like they've now. It's not a job to them. They're not leaving a livelihood, but they certainly put their commitment to the fire service because they were longtime chiefs. They were reelected, reelected that uh, they put it on the line for me. And which I go back in hindsight to say to people where I had chances to leave this community and become a career, a paid fire chief of some kind in other towns that I really had unfinished business here. And that's why I was, I've been here for so long, I think, but that was, yeah. And then, so the council, uh, the council scrambled, they, they said it had to be a full-time job. Uh, they made me the person part-time fire chief and part-time um, bylaw enforcement animal control officer. So I was, uh, I was, in, I was the dog catcher and the fire chief, uh, so to speak, uh, running those two, two departments or trying to for, for a while. It took me almost 10 years to get rid of the, by law enforcement manager <laughs> to just be the fire service guy. It, it took a long time. The council, the, the old council, the old, old, uh, you know, the politicians, they, 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 there's people in this community that really still didn't like it. Didn't like the fact that we hired a chief and who, who am I? Like what qualifications have you got? You're just a, you're just a radio announcer. You don't, you can't be a fire chief. That, that, that fire chiefs come from the big city. They're retired in the big city and they come and we hire a fire chief. We don't hire you. And there was a lot of resentment that I had to deal with. It took generational change. It took change in life for people to age and go away and in natural progression where the newcomers to the community come in and, and they, they take me at face value and know that I actually know my stuff and, 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 and properly appointed to the position. How long did that take for that generational change to go it's, up? It's it's you know I thought about that the other day and I and I thought uh, you know going back and when I used to challenge council uh, for different things or be challenged by council it 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 probably it, you know it took at least ten or twelve years uh, for for the for that generation to either forget move on I mean you had some of the older firefighters that uh, were part of the department that my dad was in and when I was they were members there too that they they didn't you know sometimes they would get their back up and they would for whatever reason take on a cause against the amalgamation or me in person uh you know and and it was it, there were some ugly times you know in terms of the uh the uh, pushback when you know when you when you went to the one big fire and and you walked away from a smoldering pile at the end of the day and and um it was a major commercial fire in, in our community and uh you know you get pushed back because you guys don't know what you're doing the fire oh boy you should have had that out you know how it is uh it was our good friend uh, chief uh, gord schreiner who contacted me right after that call saw what i was going through on social media um with the with the backlash from people that again here's an example the fire chief doesn't know what he's doing in his fire department they let a burning building burn down and it was it was gord that uh, mm-hmm. you know our friend that that said uh, that said to me, uh, you know, A, you didn't start the fire. B, you made the area safe. And C, you went home. Everybody went home. And that's that's your job. And I said, thanks. And that's the kind of words of wisdom you pick up from your colleagues. You know what I mean? Right. Now, did you know Gord before you became the fire chief? Mm, that part of the being the fire chief met met him through uh, through uh, the BC Fire Chiefs Association. One of the things I'm a big proponent for associations, and I talk about this all the time, where I, I had to get out of the community in terms of being exposed to the, to the fire service, the fire world, and the community was never used to that. The fire chiefs of the days were never used to that. They never communicated outside their community with other departments even. Uh, that has been the biggest thing, was the biggest thing in my career, that is still active today where I, I explain to people that are, you know, part of this uh, being in part of the, the service as a, as a leader that, uh, that you need to expand your horizons, get out in the world. And boy, I'll tell you, it has really made the difference. 
again, let me back up again. So you inherited an organization that was more like a social organization and not quite yet a professional organization. Uh, so how did you go about making that transition from getting people to want to be social members to getting them to want to be professional members? This this is where that moss and grass theory came about. And, and, and I want to talk about that where, you know, you start to realize there are people that want to be part of a new department that you're recruiting new members time and again, and recruitment even had to, every, everything had to change from what they were used to. You know, they, they were used to, you know, Hey, you want to be a member? Show up at the fire hall. Hi, how are you? Come on in the door. Your criteria were, can you fog up a mirror? You're in. And, and criminal records checks, nah, non-existent. Those kind of things didn't happen. You just show up at the fire hall. There was a sign on the one of the fire halls that had, come on in, Thursday night's practice night. Come on out. Come on and, and be part of the department. We'll find some gear for you. We'll get you involved. And that was, it was a community group you got involved in. And I, you had to raise the bar. And I was through the, you know, you knew things were going to happen. Things were going to change. The calls you were going on were starting to change some of the exposures that we were you know, experiencing. So you knew you had people that wanted to buy in. Plus, you had the other side that were holding you back. So I used to do, as you say, this radio talk show. Um, and one of the guests I used to always have, and uh, great to have him on the air, was Brian Minter. Brian Minter is a guy that is the gardening guru of the Fraser Valley, or British Columbia for that matter. And he had a gardening center. He had a garden, a uh, uh, show garden. And, and just to come on the show, phone lines would go crazy. People had their gardening questions. It was great. It was a dream guest. You know, you wanted to have that, bring him on, open the phones. Well, the first part of the show was nine o'clock in the morning. I'd come on after the news and I'd introduce the guest and I would have to open the questioning. Well, I'm not a gardener by any means. I mean, I mow the lawn. That's where I close to, I get to the garden, right? So at the end of the day, I'm asking, the, I said, you know, I got a problem. Um, moss in my yard. It's not everywhere, but there's one little patch, a patch of moss that is, I mean, I throw poison at it. My, my attitude is get in there and get the, get the whatever you want to put on it and kill that moss. What would you recommend? He said, leave the moss alone. Don't attack it. Don't kill it. Uh, feed the grass around it. The grass around it is stronger than the moss. And if you make it even stronger, the moss will go away on its own. So I, that was one thing. It was later in this transition of the amalgamation that I started to realize and remember back to this. And I wrote about this in, in the magazine column that I write in Firefighting in Canada, where I realized that this might work with some of the older members. Some of the older members I would consider moss, the ones that weren't helping us by holding us back by trying to do things the way we always did them um, and not allowing the newer members to learn the new ways I mean take for example the first time we experienced a thing called positive pressure ventilation do you remember bringing that into a fire hall I mean I went and trained in this new way like this was incredible we're going to put air oxygen into a fire well we we did this. We we brought it in. And of course, the older members, that's just insane. Oh, dear. What, what? Who would think of that? You don't push air into a fire. That is no, no. This is how it's done strategically for Bendelina to try to explain. Well, then I I, I, I I look back and go, hmm, well, the younger guys, the newer guys, I say younger, but the newer people, they wanted to learn. So I gave them the opportunity. I gave them the training. They, they, they said, well, can we go out and do this in our department? Yes, we can. And I would find the training and bring it in. Those other members weren't interested. So you soon saw the gap starting to widen. And then I realized that the moss, as I started to feed the grass and nurture the grass and give them what they wanted, they became strong. They became confident. They became really part of the department that was going to be the future fire department. And the older members kind of went away, kind of moved over to the side. 
and still valued members, still part of the history of the department. I still need you, but they're now starting to realize that I'm um, I'm trying to walk beside the uh, the the moving sidewalk in the airport, but people are passing me by on that little strip of uh, strip of rubber. And so again, moss and grass, feed the grass, nurture the grass. The grass will come strong and get stronger and push the moss out of the way. <laughs> and you learned that from a gardener. <laughs> I learned that from a gardening guru. And I told him that he, I said, I said, I said, I, I use his name and I say, you gave me that, that theory. And I, I kind of went with it from a leadership perspective and said, that is uh yeah, that that's the, and I still, to this day, is, I've, I've had people come back to me from the column that I wrote, right. And some uh, fire chiefs, have uh, come back and, and said, you know, I took that column and I pasted it on my on my bulletin board to remind myself that, you know, there's a future. There are people that really are interested in what you have to say and, and the direction you're heading. And, and there are some that aren't. And those some that are not worth uh, wasting your time on, really, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, a, a good strategy. Um, as I think back to my uh, first department that I was the chief I was hired in from the outside and I had a lot of moss and if I had if I had a regret now looking based on what you just coached me on I realized I probably spent too much try, time trying to deal with the moss and not enough time trying to cultivate the grass <laughs> and as a result my grass was weaker than it should have ever been because mm -hmm. I was spent so much time and effort trying to get, turn moss into grass <laughs> and and that wasn't ever going to happen although i thought if i tried hard enough it could but it it wasn't and it didn't and it yeah mm -hmm. it was a it was a it was a frustrating uh a frust frustrating four or five years to yeah to, uh, you you look back and you see that the moss would eventually just become bored or tired or realize that they don't belong they don't fit in because everyone is starting to train and, and you're not doing anything wrong by getting stronger and getting better at what you do that you soon realize wow i'm really out of place here and i either need to catch up or or you know lead follower get out of the way i need to i need to step aside um that's that's a big thing is knowing when to say when so to speak and you know, you kind of force people to realize and understand that, yeah, this is, I, I'm not firing you as a volunteer. I've done that, but I, I wasn't. And at the end of the day, I respect you, but uh, this is the new department and this is where we have to be and not going in the wrong direction. I mean, the mayors, we, we, I, I had council members as we, as we develop training and I, I, I got to thank British Columbia fire chiefs and, and the work that was done by the province, you know, they put in a training uh, you know, mandatory training that that was coming, and I knew it was coming. My connection to, through the BC Fire Chief saw this. This is coming one day. I see that we're going to have a, a a mandated training module that we we have to a standard we have to meet, and so we start to everyone has to go through this training. Well, when we we start, some members come and say, "Well, I didn't sign up for this." Well, sorry, this is you know, if you think this is bad, it's going to get worse in your mind because we're going to learn even more. And and so a pager the first night is no longer the case today. It's six months minimum before you even look at a pager and become part of a fire call, unless you're uh, unless you're happen to be out at a practice night or what have you. So I had council members one or you know one time where a council member said, "Well, your standards are too high," in a public open council meeting, I said you need to lower your standards. I said, "No," <laughs> I said it's mandated provincially, and no. I said, we are going to train to the highest standard that we can, within reason, of course, to to meet uh, safety and, and such. It doesn't matter. There was that, again, they treated the volunteer firefighter as different than a firefighter in the big city. And, you know, they were and, and whenever we lost a firefighter, you know, and then we lose one to a to a hire, you know, you, you probably had that in the volunteer world, you know, when the, they, they apply for a different job. Oh, we've lost another one. Oh, we need to keep our firefighters. That attitude today is we're a farm team. We're a farm team for the big leagues and we're proud of that. And we're happy to train our members so that uh, they, they want to be, become career firefighters in a larger career department. We're happy to be a part of that journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were, we were definitely the farm 
team in both of my communities because both of the communities I served with um, bordered big cities and we weren't the big city, but we were, mm, we were fertile ground for applicants <laughs> for the, for the big city. Let's switch and talk a little bit. Uh, you you said you'd mentioned your fire associations. What role did the fire associations play in your development as a, as a fire chief? I think uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, a, a lot of roles, a lot of, uh, you know, I say development in terms of, for example, joining the provincial association, it exposed me to the outside world of fire. You know, there is that realization that, and that, that, that was important for me to, to then try and expose the members to the outside world of fire. You know, you quickly start to realize, or at least think that you're unique. You have this little fire department and you're the only fire department ever in the world. And yeah, you see them on TV, you know, there's, there's the big city departments, um, the professional firefighters as we they would call them, which is, we use that term professional volunteers for a reason, because we train the same, we are professionals uh, at uh, the way we go about our business. But it was that exposure to the outside world and the fact that we are the same, that that we're quite a big group of people in the world and even in the province where you made those connections and we say networking is everything. It's huge. When you would go to the first conference, I went to my first Fire Chiefs Association conference in 2000. And I still, to this day, I met a guy there that was a fire chief from a small community and we were both brand new and got to know each other. And how are you? Hey, what's, what, do you, what do you do in your department? What do you do in your, what happens when this happens? You start to develop those connections in that network of people that to this day, we're still very good friends that see each other on a regular basis, 24 years later, almost. And so 23 years later. And so when you, when you learn that you are not the only fire department that exists in the world, that the problems you may be having are shared by other people in other communities, and how they became successful, how they ended up fixing what was broken. And you go, wow, that might work in my department where a moss and grass idea said, geez, you know, Tom, you came from this department. Like, well, how did, how did you deal with the fact that, you know, the guys, they, they don't want to wear their gear at the, at the calls. They just want to jump on the truck or they just want to show up at the scene. You know, and I, I said, well, this is how I did this. This is how. It... So then you start to you again learn. And then the step the next step for me was the National Association. I thought that the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs was just for the Metro Fire Chiefs. You had to be a big city fire chief to go to the National Fire Chiefs Conference. I didn't belong there. I wasn't a fire chief of a big, but wait a second, I was a fire chief. And the fire chief in Toronto is a fire chief. What's the difference? We're still fire chiefs. Five stripes, we still run fire departments. A little bit different from each other, but we still run fire departments. So yeah, I, I was told by a by a provincial chief that said to me, who was involved with the Canadians, you need to experience the Canadians. So I joined and went to my first conference in 2010, I think it was, with the Nationals, realizing that the horizon of that I, I, I work in and the BC provincial politics and such, it's a different world when you're when you're national. The the topics, the the lobbying at the federal level for for what we do from, you know, from mental health now and from cancer awareness and all those things go, that applies to me. It applies to my department. doesn't matter if we go to 10 calls a year or go to 10,000 a year. You matter and you are the same. So that's what the associations have done for me. And again, connected me to that world of fire that I bring back to our community. And I step back a bit when I say I wanted to expose my people. It was taking them to events. Uh, as sad as a as a fire department funeral is, you know, as tragic as a line of duty service is, I I was important for those guys to come. You need to come to this. I, I want you to see what the outside world is like in fire. And once they go to those kind of events, once they take part in something that's fire related, you soon realize that you're part of a bigger organization than just the fire hall or just the small department that you live in. Good wisdom. You at some point along the way in your career, you looked out on the horizon and said, 
you know, I'm going to sail into a sunset here. How did you, what did you do to prepare your organization for a succession for the day that you're gone so that the organization continues on successfully without you? There's, well, and before that, when I look and the idea of retirement was so far away in the early days, you know, I, I, we're very fortunate in career, you know, that we have pension programs that we, that we're able to be part of a plan that at some point will, will, will pay us a, an income. Um, I looked at that piece of paper every month from the reports and it was like, Oh, I, I can take my pension. It tops out as you, as it were, when I turn 60, well, I'm 35. I mean, that's, that's a mile, that's a million miles away. That, that's, I'm not uh, 60. Oh my God. Oh, okay. I'll never see that. Whatever. As things started to go around and a personal note, um, my dad was a volunteer firefighter. Um, I lost my dad uh, to illness when I was 30. And I was a radio announcer in the last uh, days of his life and in Vancouver on the national radio program. And, and then as I was actually a music host in, in Vancouver at that time, hosting a, a country radio show and he was a country music fan. So he was in hospital listening to my night show. Uh, the nurses all knew that, that he was listening and such. And, and so he passed away and, and he, uh, he was actually a town manager. He was actually at one point an administrator. He had saved for years to retire. He had saved, my mom was the same. They'd saved their, their RSPs and, and they were just planning for retirement. He never got that chance. And he's passed away at just before 60. So uh, I said to myself at one point, you know, 35, 36, 37, I'm going, I'm going to retire. I'm going to make sure I see that retirement. I want to do what he didn't do. Uh, my mom, unfortunately, got into some illness with dementia for the last 10 years of her life and didn't know who I was. She never saw me. They never knew what I became. They never knew that I wore a uniform to work every day. And I, I often think to myself, okay, I'm going to make sure that I do what I what, what they couldn't do. So as I got closer and closer to this era of 60 and, and thinking that 60, I can take this pension. And, but then again, you could work until 65 or, but then you realize that the department needs to move forward. And there's a lot of things coming down the pipe. And I mean, COVID had a, had a lot to do with it in terms of, when when the pandemic hit, we were never we were working. Firefighters, fire department, as a career fire chief, I didn't we weren't time off. We didn't work from home. We worked from the office. We were we were doing our job and still going to calls, albeit with different, you know, protocols. And but we were going to calls. We were we were responding. Um we you know, we we realize that life is short and we need to make the most of it. You know, you, you hear that you hear the phrase you only live once. Well, my term is you only die once, you live every day. And I'm going to live every day. And at the end of the day, I need to make sure this department is left in a position where it can thrive. And I don't need to be in its way holding on to something for whatever reason, saying I'm going to get my 30 years. I'm going to, no, it's not getting my 30 years. It's the next 30 years that I'm concerned about that I want to work on. So it was uh, the matter of, we need to hire a deputy. And the fact of hiring anybody after me, I was still that, 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 that hangover was still there. Like, how dare you? You were the first person you fought your way into a position. You fought your way into a job. And, and, you know, I mean, I had a mayor tell me, you better not cost us any money. You know, I said, well, I'm going to put it, get a uniform. We don't need uniforms. Yeah, we need uniforms. We need the members to be identified. We need to build this. So that was part of these little tiny things. So the, 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 the idea was that we need to hire a succession. We need to hire a deputy chief. And the, the council and mayor of the day were very progressive, starting to see the things the way they should be and going, you, 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 you do not need to go outside the community. I think that'd be the worst thing you can do in a small town is to put up a posting outside of our town and have our local guys either compete with somebody from a larger metro department or don't even consider them. And I, you know, with all due respect to my colleagues in the, in the Metro departments, but a retired fire officer from a large city retiring in our community and being the fire chief would not work. I could see our department shutting down. I mean, I literally could see no buy-in from our members. 
So basically we had a member that uh, has, we've qualified over the years and said, uh, this is our guy uh, and groomed this position, groomed this person, eventually got the approval to hire a deputy with the intent that I was going to leave and brought him in and went through some major events and incidents. And it was incredible to have that second person, you know, you wish, wow, what would have been like over my career to have this person in place, this position in place. Uh, we had a major storm event in 2021, uh, what we call an atmospheric river, several of them, which is basically uh, a major rainstorm, a fire hose of water being pointed into our community, putting over 200 millimeters of rain in 24 hours, flooding all the roads, all the all five highways closed. We had 1,200 people stranded in our community. We were running an emergency center on the side of our desk trying to deal with this event for four or five days as we were shut down. Again, having that deputy run the fire department when I was able to run the operation was incredible. So it was, uh, the writing was on the wall and I needed to, I know I needed to move over, lead follower, get out of the way, and I wasn't going to hold back the team. So that's where, that's where the first, the fire chief came in and then the deputy followed under a bit of a strategy I came up with. <laughs> Nice. So what advice would you give for someone that's preparing for their retirement? How do they, how do they make that transition successfully? A lot of people really struggle with making. You know, and I said, I've had discussions. I'm, um, I, again, realizing that it's retirement's not the end. Retirement is a change into a different position right you're just changing you're, you're changing jobs you're changing roles uh responsibilities i i the fire service is a lot different now this this conversation to have with just anybody and i say that with all due respect just anybody is different than a fire service person we are unique people when you grow up in a small town when you operate as a career fire chief 23 years of having a radio or a pager by your bed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't go on holidays. You have holiday time. And if you do go on holidays, you're still connected. You like you still have the calls on your phone. You still see what's happening. You're still responsible. Um, that is the biggest thing. The biggest change is, and it's a relief. I mean, it's a sigh of relief. That ceremonial turning off of the pager was incredible where I said, that's it. I'm off. And wow. Um, but for those that think that, okay, great idea, 60, I can take my pension. And there's different pension plans for fire chiefs that up, up your pension even a bit more uh, here in BC that, that it, it's really, you know, yeah, financial planning is what it is and all those kind of things. But at the end of the day, you have to be prepared to not be in charge. And while it's good to be king, it's good to be the chief, it's good to be known as the chief, you have to realize that you're still a chief. But in some communities, some think, well, that's it, it's all over. And that's, it's like a divorce. I mean, it's, it's like all of a sudden, the life I used to lead, used to be in charge, used to be, hey, chief, hey, chief, it's going to go away. It soon came to realize that it doesn't go away, per se. You're still, respectfully, you're still the chief. You're still a chief. Uh, a doctor is always going to be a doctor, just not necessarily licensed to practice. Uh, so you've earned that. So that's what I deal with when I talk to people that realize that at 35, 60 seems so long away and so far away and so old. But when you hit 60 and realize, wow, I mean, I feel like I'm 35. Uh, that I, retirement is that, that, I guess that it's that uh, predetermined ideal of, oh, you have to be that old person that goes into, you know, quits their job at 70, 80 years old, and, and all of a sudden, that's it, it's over. Life is just sitting in a rocking chair. Um, no, you, you, what, what, what service are you doing to the fire department by being in charge when you're 75 years old? And, and a department, again, I go back to the COVID time, our call volume increased. We started to go out and do more and more and more and got into medical. Our people said, we want to do medical. We want to start to be trained properly. Uh, you know, it's one thing to go to, on a medical call and just lift a patient, a heavy patient, do a lift assist, as we call it. But the requirements say you have to be a first responder, licensed. Okay, so we get to that level. 
bang, we are now going out on cardiac arrests when there is no ambulance nearby. Again, providing a service to the community. So as our call volume increased, it stayed the same. It stayed at that level. We are 750 calls a year in our small fire department. We're doing two and three a day. And they're still volunteer paid on call with now two paid members. So, you know, it's, it's, but the end user doesn't realize that things have changed in the department. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's been status quo with a slight improvements, big, big improvements. But at the end of the day, they don't see the duck's feet under the water paddling like crazy. They just see the duck floating on top. And that duck is still doing its job, still providing a service to the public, but the feet have been kicking like crazy and making changes all the way. When did you retire? Officially January of 2023, January 19th. I was off for nine and a half weeks of used holiday time. Um, but, uh, and which is again, unique. You think I'm off, I'm done. New chief's got the, got the helm, has got the calm. But uh, I had a, a buddy of mine, my auctioneer buddy, who called me up on my retirement date and said, congratulations, January 19th, congratulations. I said, I've been off for nine weeks. He goes, no, no. If, if the town, half the town burnt down, that was yours. <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, he says, no, it's not yours. And that's a huge th difference. It's a huge thing. It's one thing to be off, but one thing to be off and not responsible. And so that's where the fire difference is compared to the store owner that retires and has to leave their business. You know, it, yeah, you have an identity, um, but certainly you have a huge weight of responsibility and as i go back to the days when i first began as the fire chief that i mean that responsibility people were watching you and when they're watching you that that public that put you in a position you are a public servant we hired you and approved that hiring that you better not screw up and if you well, we're watching every move you make for all those years and um yeah it's 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 scary in terms of why. Wow, and I think the scary part is not necessarily, yeah, it's that financial part. I told someone the other day, I said, they said, what's it like to be retired? I said, it's like winning the lottery, except for the money part. But it's it's the it's the it's the same, you know, that that I'm living right now. I, I'm I'm realizing that I have 365 days of something new every day until January the 19th, 2024, when I've okay, that's been a year of doing that. Um I think the the connection to the fire department was the one that I was afraid to lose. But again, I go back to saying that I was the first ever paid fire chief, realizing I'm the first ever paid fire chief and hope to retire. How do you treat a retired chief? How do you treat an older member of the fire department? We've got members of the department that are still on the department and they do a great job that were there when I was when I was trying to be the chief. And and they they have they have a role. They do their job. They, they're happy to be there. But firefighting is certainly a young person's game. And and you soon realize that I am could be holding people back by not learning and not training and not getting up to speed on what's going on. I mean, I look now and I watch and I still mentor my guys and, and they call me for advice and such. And you watch through the associations things that are coming down the pipe right now. I mean, it's it's incredible. I mean, the, the fire service in Canada, it's the volunteer service is, you know, we're hurting. We're just, it's like, oh, but not my circus and not my monkey <laughs> attitude, right? <laughs> but I think I've been able to do some peer support work right now with the provincial association. I'm on a peer support team um, and I've had members reach out and yeah, I, I'm there for that demographic, you know, that demographic of, of the retired chief that took his retirement when he was 60, 61 uh, ish. And uh, it's available to us, but most are hanging on until they're 65 and what have you traditional ways. But I'm not about that traditional way. I, I wanted to make sure that again, I had the opportunity that like my parents never had. And I was going to make sure that I did that, albeit the fact that it's cut into my livelihood so to speak <laughs> but but you need to do what's right and um yeah that was the and and don't be afraid of it uh, and and the idea that we've we've created an operational guideline for example on how to treat a retired fire chief because the the fire chief of today is a younger person and he, he will retire and uh you know do you get a do you get a tunic with you retired on it do you get to you call yourself fire chief ret do you you know those you're invited to certain things I me mean, i'm invited to do training and do peer support with our people i still connected i'm still involved i'm still 
technically a paid on call member of the department so I can come out and do stuff and, and do routine things that need doing and, and things. So I'm still there um, helping out and being a part of the, of the organization. So it's, it's the family and yeah, even though you're divorced, so to speak, uh, you still are connected to the family and that's, that's the important thing. All right. Well, we've been at it a little over an hour, so we're going to, we're going to put a wrap on it. Thank you for coming on and sharing what I would call a, key, a career's worth of wisdom with, uh, with our viewers and listeners. Uh, is there anything you'd want to say in closing that you haven't had the chance to say because I didn't ask you the right question? I, I would I would I would say in closing just a, a piece of advice I gave to a young firefighter um, and I said to that person I said the best thing and you know this as well the best thing we can teach a young firefighter is how to become an old one and that's through what we do for safety it's what we do for uh, you know longevity it's what we do for being a part of that family and and growing with that family. And that's that's one of the most important things we can do, whether it's a volunteer or a career firefighter that I think we can do. Yeah, amen. Well, Tom, thank you for being a guest and thank you for the gift of your service to the District of Hope. Thanks, Rich, appreciate it. Thank you to retired Fire Chief Tom DeSorcy for sharing your story of how you went quickly from being a volunteer firefighter to a career fire chief. If you've been following along with me on my social media for a while, you know that I took a six month sabbatical from teaching live events on the road. For the 14 years leading up to the pandemic, I consistently delivered between 90 and 120 live programs each year. Taking some time off helped to recharge my batteries and helped to remind me of just how passionate I am about the topic of situational awareness. That time off also provided an opportunity for our master instructors that we train to step up and deliver some programs in lieu of me. And now, as Willie Nelson most famously sang, I'm on the road again. If you're interested in joining me for an upcoming program, here's where we're going to be. On December 9th, I'll be at the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association Conference in Ocean City, Maryland. This will be the fourth time I've delivered programs for the Maryland Fire Chiefs Association, so thank you for those opportunities. On January 22 through February 2, I will be at the Syncrude Oil Refinery in Fort McMurray, Alberta. At the conclusion of this visit, I will have delivered 71 programs for Syncrude as part of their Periods of High Vulnerability program, where we help process operators with the skills to have better situation awareness and improve their decision making. On February 5 through 9, I will be at the Suncor Edmonton Refinery in Alberta. Suncor is the parent company to Syncrude, and since Syncrude has experienced, in their words, a fundamental change and their organizational culture as a result of our training, the program is being rolled out to all their other refineries as well. And this will be our third visit to Suncor Edmonton. On February 10, following our visit to Suncor, we're going to deliver a program for the Canadian Task Force Two in Calgary, Alberta. And this will be my first time presenting to that group, so I'm really excited about that. On February 29th, I'll be delivering a program for the Center for Public Safety Excellence Conference in Orlando, Florida. And this will be the eighth time that I've uh, presented for the CPSE Excellence Conference. So thank you for your faith and confidence in, in the opportunity to turn back. And this time we'll be talking about administrative situational awareness. On March 1 and 2, I'll be at the Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire Department in Spotsylvania, Virginia. And this will be my second program at Spotsylvania Volunteer Fire Department. The first one was during the pandemic, we did a virtual program. So now they're having me come back and do two days of live training on situational awareness for them. On March four and five, I'll be at the University of Maryland's National Fire Service Staff and Command Program in Annapolis, Maryland. This will be my 22nd year presenting at the National Fire Service Staff and Command Program. So thank you to the Maryland Fire and Rescue Institute for your faith and confidence to give me now 22 years of opportunity to 
share my message with your conference attendees. April 19 and 20, I'll be at the Taos County Fire Department in Red River, New Mexico. And I'm especially excited for this program as New Mexico is the only U.S. state where I have not presented a program. And next April, that comes off of a bucket list and that will complete all 50 states. And our master instructors will be working hard to add programs as well. Collectively, we've got more than 30 programs scheduled from September through December of 2023. And you can see the list of all the upcoming programs on the essaymatters.com website. Now, I would like to also take a moment to thank some of the hosts for some of our recent programs and our recent consultations. Um, we're really appreciative of the opportunity that, that are given to us, and we just can't pass along enough the, the love that we have for these organizations. On September, September 27th, I conducted a training for failure program for the Swissville Fire Department. They're a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is the sixth program that I delivered for Swissville Fire Department and the fire departments in their region. So thank you to Fire Chief Clyde Wilhelm for that opportunity. On September 28th, I facilitated a discussion with line of duty death investigators for NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And we did that in Morgantown, West Virginia. And these are the investigators that evaluate firefighter line of duty death incidents. And they're, they're looking to build more lessons about situational awareness, high risk decision making, and human factors and human error into their investigations and reports. So I'm working with them on that. On September 29th and 30th, I conducted two programs for the Wisconsin Rapids Fire Department in Wisconsin. One was on situational awareness and one was on preparing for your climb down the ladder, leaving the fire service by retirement or injury or health or whatever reason, being ready for that. On October 4th, I gave a presentation for the Colorado Traffic Incident Management Conference in Denver, Colorado. And this is my second time delivering a program for the Colorado Traffic Incident Management Conference. So thank you for the opportunity to be invited back for an encore presentation. On November 9 through 12, I was at the International Association of Fire Chiefs in Clearwater Beach, Florida, the Symposium in the Sun, where I awarded two scholarships uh, from my company. The scholarships are designed to recognize emerging leaders and this year's winners were Assistant Chief Jeff Greger from the Maple Bluff, Wisconsin Fire Department and Battalion Chief Matt Alto from Estacada Rural Fire District in Oregon. And then on November 27 through December 1, I was back at the Suncor Edmonton Refinery in Alberta and we were training process operators on situational awareness and high risk decision making. If you're interested in hosting a live event or a virtual program, just click on the Contact Us tab at the top of the SA Matters homepage and I'll give you a call. Finally, remember to check the show notes for how to subscribe to our newsletter and how to follow us on social media. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 397 of the Situational Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you again to my guest, retired Fire Chief Tom DeSorcy, for sharing your story about the challenges you faced when you went from being a volunteer firefighter to a career fire chief, literally almost overnight. And thank you to our viewers and listeners for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there. And may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters Show with Dr. Richard Gassaway. If you're interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit his website, essaymatters.com. If you're interested in booking Dr. Gassaway for a program, or if you would like to be a guest on his show, click the Contact Us tab at the top of the homepage.